Welcome to series four of the Public Interest Technology Colloquium. We are delighted to be back with this new series and have an engaging program lined up. My name is Katina Michael and I'm the Director of the Society Policy Engineering Collective in the School for the Future of Innovation in Society at Arizona State University and I'm also the Editor-in-Chief of the IEEE Transactions on Technology and Society. I'm joined today by my co-host Dr. Roba Abbas, who's a senior lecturer in the School of Business at the University of Wollongong, Australia, and the Socio-Technical Systems Technical Committee Chair at the IEEE. Roba and I would like to acknowledge the work and support of Melissa Waite and the events team at the College of Global Futures at ASU. Now, I'd like to take a moment to reflect on our colloquium to date. We journeyed from Series 1, which focused on values, responsible innovation, and COVID-specific technological responses, to series two, which centered on storytelling, imagination, and participatory design methodologies, to series three, which emphasized the global perspective with respect to the social, regulatory, ethical, and technological considerations relevant to design, development, and the delivery of technology in the public interest. In this series, we illuminate a path toward transdisciplinarity, hosting international speakers who will share their perspectives on experts and expertise, innovation ecosystems, multi-stakeholder approaches, and opportunities and challenges relating to addressing complex societal challenges. We're delighted to be hosting today Professor Elias Karayanis. Dr. Elias Karayanis is a full professor of science, technology, innovation, and entrepreneurship, as well as co-founder and co-director of the Global and Entrepreneurial Finance Research Institute, Jerry Jeffrey, and Director of the European Union Research Center at the School of Business of the George Washington University in Washington, DC. Dr. Karyanis' teaching and research activities focus on strategic government university industry R&D partnerships, technology road mapping, technology transfer and commercialization, international science and technology policy, technological entrepreneurship, and regional economic development. Today, Professor Karyanis will present on helical architectures, the emerging unified theory of helical architectures, UTOHA, democratic and sustainable knowledge economies and societies and more. Welcome Professor Elias to the Public Interest Technology uh, Colloquium. We're so honored to have you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the uh, opportunity. And uh, yeah, it's really wonderful uh, there are so many uh, shared areas of interest. I will share some thoughts, and this is uh, ongoing research, um, some themes that, as you see, uh, are interwoven and hopefully complementary and reinforcing. Uh, there is some complexity, but also hopefully we'll, we'll have some clarity. Uh, what this is about is really uh, most of the things we're experiencing daily. Um, we are uh, confronted increasingly individually and as societies by uh, challenges that are compounding and they are converging and they are rather uh, complex, as I said already, and challenging to address and cope with. And hopefully, uh, we'll have a better tomorrow, but this will require some concerted action and some uh, uh, reinvention. Uh, we'll talk a lot about digital transformation. I'll talk about analog, digital to analog, in effect, uh, emphasizing the need for human-centric, not just technocentric uh, philosophies in design of technology, but to come back to our broader context here, the title is about democracy, environment, and technology, how they interact, interplay, and what we can do uh, to have a better tomorrow, as I said, concerning both democracy and the environment. Uh, technology, uh, and of course, in the context of public interest technology, uh, should be broadly viewed uh, as a concept and set of technologies, including, of course, artificial intelligence applications. Um, the interest and the focus and the, uh, the, 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 the context is about, of course, theory, but also policy practice and politics. 
the issues we're discussing uh, relate to not just the uh, theory, but also the policy practice and politics considerations because they 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 all feed off each other and they impact each other. Uh, just a brief uh, mention of uh, some of the related projects I've been involved in with colleagues in terms of research, uh, macro, meso, and micro levels. And these uh, cover different areas that uh, touch on innovation. In particular, uh, you see possibly the term scarce here. This is, a, in fact, a term we've uh, created and I have trademarked, in fact, this is strategic knowledge, arbitrage, and serendipity effects. And uh, we developed this concept and related uh, under, underpinning concepts to address uh, the entrepreneurial ecosystem dynamics and open that black box, if you wish, trying to deal with and open the black box of innovation and trying to develop uh, grounded theory, understanding and anticipating and controlling to some extent uh, discontinuities and disruptions. Um, the quadruple and quintuple innovation helix concepts are also uh, themes we'll talk about tonight briefly. And these are uh, frameworks, tools we've developed to uh, both study, understand, and also propose uh, how, why, and, and uh, where uh, policy and practice intervention should be uh, formulated and, uh, and, and, and uh, applied for a better result, for more effective and efficient, more efficacious, if you wish, ecosystem design. Um, there are different platforms, publishing platforms, journals, book series, and so forth. I'll be happy to further discuss um, for those of you who may be uh, or are doctoral candidates or in, certainly interested in research and publication. I'm happy to also come back to these themes. Now, for more context, uh, one, uh word is democracy uh or operant term tonight and the other is uh the environment um there's a little there's an interview i gave in fact uh, in the fall of 20 uh, uh as how and why i consider democracy and the environment endangered species um that has been, of course, uh, an issue for some time now, but it became uh, has become increasingly uh, apparent, unfortunately, uh, recently and recent developments in Europe and elsewhere. So the point is that it's important to figure out and always try to make the world safe for democracy, but also democracy safe for the world. Uh, and figure out ways for uh, increased shared prosperity as a foundation for sustainable uh, democracy, peace, and environment, uh, per se. Um, they all go up or down together, unfortunately. And so in that sense, this concept, um, this is from a 2005 book of mine where I talk about smart uh, development uh, from socio uh, economic being to techno-economic becoming implies and relates to how to, in a sense, advance and ideally uh, leapfrog even, figure out ways and means, again, policies, practices, and shape politics so that, that, a, that a country and a society, um, while maintaining its democratic institutions, can actually progress substantially um, and uh, move from subsist subsistence-based to knowledge driven, not, not just knowledge based, but actually uh, a, an economy and a society that is uh, very intensely and creatively producing new knowledge and solutions uh, based on that knowledge, whether it's high technology or other types of uh, artifacts that are adding value. So it's not just about high tech. So it's about moving from natural or perhaps even artificial scarcity to technology and knowledge enabled abundance. Uh, and there are a lot of issues here. Uh, in some cases, we have abundance and we intentionally create condi conditions of scarcity um, so that certain interests can benefit more than the public good. Of course, this. Uh, broader, bigger discussion, uh, but that also relates to this um, 
line of thought. Now, in addition, continuing with this discussion of the local, regional, and global context, um, we have uh, systems, networks, and sectors of innovation that are converging, as we know, and uh, they're both globalizing but also localizing. And this is sort of a pendulum effect a phenomenon that over time uh, moves in one direction or the other more. Uh, we've had globalization for some time, and of course, uh, recently there's been much uh, more of a decoupling uh, set of trends and tendencies for geopolitical, geoeconomic, and of course, geotechnological reasons. Um, the, the breakdown of supply chains, global supply chains has actually made that uh, manifested the need for more localization, uh, for instance, in addition to other reasons. So the point is, how can we uh, better uh, synthesize, uh, again, sustainable, uh, financially, uh, socially, uh, and environmentally solutions um, that build on technologies and advance, again, the public interest. Uh, and when I say public interest, and I'll talk about that later, in fact, we, we should be thinking of not just public, but in fact, public, private, people, and planet interest, right? So this is P4IT in a way, not just PIT. Um, the uh, knowledge, the, the, the ways and means that knowledge is produced um, has been studied for some time, and Novotny and Gibbons and others have talked about uh, mode one and mode two knowledge production systems. Uh, that sort of reflects uh, the, the 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 move from linear to non-linear uh, chain link types of innovation models, and uh, we introduced the mode three uh, knowledge production system concept to emphasize the the significance and the need for higher order learning that relates to uh, thinking uh, and approaches that are both transdisciplinary and also very transformative in their essence. You don't just acquire facts and figures. You don't even just change how you learn, but you change um, how you 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 learn how to learn. Okay, so it's learning, learning to learn, and learning to learn how to learn. Um, and the point is that this is, uh, as you see, a multilateral, multimodal multi-nodal and multi-layered uh, model. Uh, and this is the foundation for the quadruple helix government, university, industry, and civil society. I'll show you the graphic uh, shortly. And then of course the quintuple, which includes the environment, adds the environment to this. Um, the way knowledge is created, shared, diffused, absorbed, and uh, transformed is through processes of co-petition, co-specialization, and co-evolution, as well as of course, co-creation. Um, and so the question here is, should we, uh, how should we design our, our policies, practices, and shape our po politics to enable, uh, in fact, facilitate, but also accelerate, trigger, catalyze, and accelerate uh, smart growth? Um, that often implies and even requires uh, what we call leapfrogging strategies. You can't just uh, go through the entire process that others, other countries have gone through. And in fact, uh, given the environmental issues and implications of development, that often tends to be dirty business, literally polluting business. Um, the, the, the capacity to leapfrog and move across stages of development without necessarily uh, incurring all the costs and externalities and negative externalities uh, concerning certain pollution, but even uh, corruption and other effects um, is certainly very desirable. In addition to accelerating that growth to ensure that you capture the imagination of your citizens and you maintain, if you wish, their confidence populism feeds off cynicism, disappointment, and despair, as we know all too well. 
And this is one of the biggest threats to democracies. Um, if you're following politics uh, in, in Europe right now, it will be an interesting year next year in the US as well. But in Europe, we've had uh, very interesting developments in Sweden and we'll get elections in this coming Sunday in Italy where uh, extreme right uh, parties may actually uh, wield significant uh, uh, disproportionate influence. And that is of great concern. So the point here being is that uh, skipping uh, the transitioning stages is very desirable, but it's harder to accomplish uh, than to uh, envision and dream. Technology can play a very important role, but it also is a question of uh, goodness of fit in a way of institutions, capabilities, absorptive capacities, if you wish, for individuals, societies, and economies, and uh, appropriate policies and practices. And on that, uh, we'll talk, if and as time allows, about the ideas of industry and society 5.0 and going beyond those. Um, so uh, let's talk about the essential elements of my discussion, my presentation and our discussion tonight. First of all, uh, the what. Um, Industry 5.0 and Society 5.0 and beyond. Uh, Industry 4.0, of course, is the uh, established uh, standard framework for introducing digitalization, as it's called, digital transformation. Uh, I like to emphasize this uh, point here, uh, being an engineer myself and being very much aware of what uh, digitalization means. It is a type of filtering. And in effect, what that means is you're you're pruning out, you're, you're, you're cutting out, you're excluding nuances. So if you, if you uh, map that into the socioeconomic, sociopolitical, and also sociotechnical context, that has very serious implications, uh, even dangerous implications. Um, the uh, impoverishing, if you wish, of our discourse of our thinking, our, our dialogue, our dialectics uh, is very, uh, very tricky business. We need to be very careful. And this is something we've seen in general with the advent of the internet and certainly uh, the blossoming of the social media. Um, and in effect, what I'd like to think of the uh, chaining uh, in a way of our of our thought, uh, and and the uh, impoverishment again uh, of our language of thought, uh, trying to tweet our thoughts in 140 or whatever characters are allowed nowadays. This is extremely efficient, but also it's extremely limiting. And so the digitalization cuts out the nuances, and they can be very significant. Uh, parts of the message, uh, and and uh, this is the idea of moving from digital to analog, not just analog to digital. You do want the digitalization, but you want to ensure that actually it is balanced and uh, complemented and enriched as needed by the nuances, as I call them. Okay, so that's what I mean with moving from technocentric to human centric design theories, policies, practices, and politics. Okay, so this um, relates or, or sort of as underpinned by several publications. I've shared this with uh, Professor Michael and uh, uh, so I can share those with you. Uh, they talk about these different ideas and how uh, our ongoing research has been uh, highlighting and, and, and elucidating some of the underlying dimensions and implications. Then next is the how. We talked about the what, the how is about tools, ways and means for achieving that, 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 that digital to analog and analog to digital approach, a balanced approach, uh, building on the industry and society 5.0 and beyond. Um, using specifically these frameworks and, 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 and an integrated approach. That's what the UTOHA is about. It's an acronym, uh, emerging, 
uh, unified uh, theory of helical or helix architectures. Okay, so the idea is rather than talking about or trying to to, to sort of a shoehorn or pigeonhole our uh, perspectives and our 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 design thinking into specific uh, frameworks, a triple helix, quadruple, and quintuple, and I'd like to discuss briefly why it matters whether we talk about the triple or the quintuple helix. Um, the triple helix, as you probably know, is uh, and, and all of these helices, of course, uh, are inspired by the uh, the double helix, uh, the DNA uh, model in biology. In fact, um, recently it has been found that in nature there is also uh, instances of quadruple helices. Of course, symmetry, for obvious reasons, has to exist in nature uh, for biological sustainability. Uh, but beyond that, the triple helix is really uh, a model based on government university industry perspectives and interactions, and it's, it's very much a top-down model. And I have related publications where I discuss the differences, including a recent one, which is where we talked about the UTOHA, uh, the Unified Theory of Helical Architectures, and uh, the difference, therefore, between the triple helix and the quadruple and quintuple is that they quadruple add civil society, the bottom-up perspective, and focusing on uh, the role, the needs, expectations, and capabilities of and talents of citizens, groups, and so forth, grassroots movements, and uh, society as a whole. And then, of course, the quintuple takes the environment into consideration. So the quintuple innovation helix is the more complete one, uh, but there is a difference across these. And what we try to do, as I talked before about efficacious ecosystems design, is under constraints to figure out best possible, best in, in, in breed, so to speak, and that is effectively sub-optimization of policies and practices using agile design thinking uh, methodologies and related toolkits. We have a, a publication uh, on that, uh, the ambidextrous, robust and resilient impact assessment of sustainable smarter specialization strategies. This is about uh, the, the application context is smart specialization, smarter specialization strategies in the European uh, theater. And then of course, another related paper is um, in the European Journal of Operations Research, um, OR for Entrepreneurial Ecosystems, where we look at different approaches to defining problems and related to ecosystems design, and then using and compiling and assessing different methodologies. The why, why all do all these things matter? Well, they do because, as I said earlier, I do believe that democracy in the environment should be considered endangered species. And if we don't uh, adopt a clear mindset as to what that is, what it means, and what it implies for our futures and our children's futures, um, we will be in dire straits. And therefore, this is very clearly an issue of developed democracies versus emerging autocracies. And ironically, as we speak, uh, in a sense, um, there are uh, leaders of developed democracies uh, gathering in New York, in the United Nations, which has become more of a divided nations nowadays, unfortunately. And then, of course, there is the uh, gathering in Samarkand of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization with all the autocrats uh, fetting each other and. Uh, celebrating their power, I guess, for now. So uh, let's uh, continue then. Um, these are just references, again, that your professor can share with you, has already received from me. And it's worth looking into those because, for instance, there's a couple of the end readings about the future of the internet, the Web3 or metaverse, taking the issues that I raised before about including about the pruning out of nuances 
to the next level. And um, I'm talking about the metaverse paradigm, so to speak. And then, of course, a write up about Bill Gates and his concerns. And there's, of course, Elon Musk and his paranoia about AI and so forth. So, um, in a more hopefully uh, concrete way, uh, I have proposed, and this is uh, published in one uh, on the webpage of one of my uh, the journals that I edit, the Journal of the Knowledge Economy by Springer. Uh, this what we call the New Earth Initiative. This was published, in fact, last fall before the uh, events in Ukraine and so forth. Um, it, it is about. And it certainly was inspired or triggered by the, the recent COPS meeting uh, in Glasgow. And this is about figuring out ways that we can, in a way, leapfrog our problems and not just be reactive, but proactive. And that's why I talk about how, let's figure out how to reduce the average Earth uh, temperature uh, increase, not just the rate of increasing uh, of the temperature. So. Um, the point being here is that we need to, as I say in the red uh, comments, we need to get, engage as a species proactively in higher order learning, learning also from other species in our planet to pursue a coherent, consistent, and continuous. And this is a big challenge, by the way, regarding democracies uh, and an ironic advantage the autocracies have is that the politicians, the leaders in general of democratic regimes are inevitably focused on the next elections. There should be some way to balance the short term with the long term, because this is a long term game. And uh, uh, this is about, I call, as I call it, in fact, it involves everybody uh, on the planet, whether they're more or less democratically minded. Um, there, there should be a global green growth strategy uh, promoting negative carbon footprint, leveraging technologies in the public interest, um, and uh, things like geoengineering. Of course, there's a lot of discussion uh, about the risks of playing God in that sense. At the same time, uh, avoiding risk is not a risk management strategy, as we know well. So we should be making calculated choices and taking calculated risks. Um, in, in addition to geoengineering, uh, there is uh, nuclear fusion, another uh, type of technology that, assuming that we can handle the underlying risks, is a truly green technology and one that has been benefiting in the last few years substantially uh, by technological advances. And it's pretty interesting timing. We've had some publications in the last two or three years, including in the IEEE transactions in engineering management about um, fusion. Uh, there's an article with the title Fusion Diffusion. Um, there's a discussion there about the potential and implications and, of course, risks of fusion technologies, nuclear fusion, um, what's happening now in Europe and the uh, energy uh, blackmail issues uh, certainly highlights that, I think. Um, so we need to figure out ways to have different initiatives that are obviously pro proposing or attempting to advance different uh, powers globally, whether it's the US or China or what have you they inevitably will coexist. They need to figure out ways to collaborate, as I say, within, within a competitive context, but they need to engage and there should be a way to, um, to do so without uh, getting to very uh, negative, disruptive uh, effects. Um, hopefully, as I say, through balanced, ecologically friendly, strategic and transparent policies, practices and politics. Now, some examples of, uh, or use cases, if you wish, of the New Earth Initiative. Um, I won't discuss in great detail these. Each one of those is, a, uh, is, is an opportunity for study and research. And in fact, uh, doctor, do, doctoral research, um, radically reinventing cost-benefit analysis. Uh, in fact, in the US, the Office of Science and Technology Policy 
in, in Washington has been uh, promoting uh, new ways to take into account, sort of do more environmental accounting. Um, and this is somewhat related. Um, we need to develop uh, and advance in a thinking beyond the box manner. And again, this, these are terms I've coined to highlight, denote the difference between thinking inside the box, thinking outside the box, which is still related to referring to some kind of box. So there's, there's a bias of a previous framework to thinking beyond the box, um, unleashing your creativity and imagination. Of course, not forgetting the pre-existing boxes, so to speak, but actually allowing yourself to really uh, do ideation, as we call it. So we need to think in that manner in terms of metrics, measurement, meaning, monitoring, and management issues, approaches and methodologies, um, leveraging technology like big data analytics and semantics um, in the instant economy context um, to know in real time what's going on and what we need to do, rather averaging out things and through the digitalization process, filtering out nuances. We should... Um, welcome and leverage the nuances in that sense and in real time then it's about adopting the second example is adopting and leveraging broadly the power of knowledge innovation entrepreneurship ecosystems um and i have a use case here i don't know if i'll have the time to discuss in detail today but this is a stream uh, and significant stream of our ongoing research where you will use intelligent agents uh, modeling and and other uh, methods to uh, uh, represent ecosystems, innovation, and entrepreneurship ecosystems, and and look at ways and means and the triggers, catalysts, and accelerators of knowledge creation, diffusion, and use to identify where value is best created, most effectively and efficiently, and used. And the idea here is to, um, along with creating the proper environments and contexts, with the proper policies and practices to catalyze and encourage entrepreneurial and innovative action initiative from the bottom up to create new value and in a sustainable way. Uh, a third example is this time variable, nonlinear scale and scope driven, full spectrum, positive to negative tax rate policies. I mean, there's a big deal with the R&D tax credits and renewing them or not, and whether we, you know the US should have industrial policy or not, and all these things, uh, including, by the way, uh, the uh, bipartisan model. Democracies are, by nature, inevitably much more complex. And uh, while I do understand and respect tradition and the wisdom of the founding fathers, fathers, so to speak, uh, in, in, in the US and the Constitution, we may really need to revisit some things. And that has become very apparent in the recent years with populism and other things. I mean, what happened on January 6, 2021, uh, it was a major wake up call. I'm talking about what happened on the Capitol. So the point here is that we should really allow for technology to guide again our policies in the same manner nowadays, there's a lot of fretting about interest rates and what the Fed should or should not be doing and when and how fast. And in itself, the Fed is more than 100 years old. It's very pertinent, very important of an institution, but in many ways, it may be outdated. Uh, and I know they, they have the knowledge and the, the tools, uh, you know, cutting edge, uh, but we may actually need bleeding edge technologies there, again, in the public interest to figure out smarter ways to deal with, um, uh, you know, predicting, preventing, and preempting even inflation. So anyway, uh, let me uh, return to the themes I have listed here. A broad spectrum of geoengineering technologies. I talked about that before uh, earlier, and and this should not be a few isolated uh, uh, experiments or pilots. It should be truly global, involving all the major countries, the US, EU, China, Russia, India, and really figure out with a scale and scope that are appropriate how to bring about true change in, in taking control of our environmental future, so to speak. Um, 
the EU could play a major role in this regard, as I call it here, geostep bridge, uh, geostrategic, technological, economic, and political type of bridge and launchpad uh, across continents and also, uh, you know, sort of uh, superpower divides. Um, and finally, um, in addition to the top-down policies and practices outlined above, uh, figure out a way to uh, scale to, to con by the continued through the continued triggering and scaling up of bottom-up initiatives involving individuals, associations, and networks, um, leveraging different techniques and methodologies, technology like crowdsourcing, but also crowdstorming and crowdfunding, um, AI-enabled Internet of Things modalities to allow targeted, dynamically adaptive, and powerfully effective interventions, predicting, preventing, and preempting polluting actions and ineffective attempts at pollution control and mitigation. So avoiding, of course, we always need to learn. And in this uh, write-up I have on the New Earth Initiative, I have this saying or this, this thought that I came up with, uh, to where is human, uh, to learn is sublime. Well, we should definitely be learning from our mistakes, but we should, given the context here, we should do all we can to minimize error and certainly avoid error repetition. Okay. Um, if you still are with me, I will go now into more specific ideas and concepts discussion. First of all, uh, a caveat here about the innovator and a comment from our friend Machiavelli, um, you have, in fact, enemies, not friends, uh, among those you're trying to disrupt. Uh, until, of course, and this is related to the concept uh, that uh, uh, Thomas Kuhn and others have written about um, the science of the nature of scientific revolutions and so forth, the paradigm shift concept. There's tremendous resistance until there's enough critical mass, then everything changes uh, to your uh, advantage and benefit. And so it's you're on top of the hill, then it's easier going, I guess. Um, briefly, a, a, a view of the different frameworks, starting with Industry 4.0, which is much more technocentric, as we know, and we see the different components, systems integration, additive manufacturing, uh, and so forth, Internet of Things. Um, then 5.0 extends, expands, advances the uh, industry 4.0. Uh, the European Commission in January 21 uh, published a paper or a white paper on industry 5.0, recognizing its significance. I'm among those who have been writing about this for some time now. Uh, it's about moving from a technocentric to more of a human-centric uh, perspective, uh, making sure technology uh, becomes and remains part of the solution and not doesn't become part of the problem, including uh, risks of AI uh, sort of um, um, rebelliousness, let's say. Um, then, of course, there's this concept coming out of Japan of Society 5.0, along with the technology, the evolution of technological frameworks like uh, Industry 1.0, 2.0, and so forth, there is a similar uh, progression of society of, of society frameworks, paradigms. And the idea of Society 5.0 being one where uh, what we call, as we will see, super smart society technology, again, is truly uh, at the service of the individual and helps minimize the gaps um helps move from uh, natural scarcity to artificial abundance increasingly as i mentioned earlier and you see here a map of all these technologies and how they can help improve our lives hopefully um now uh, in the context of our discussion um smart sustainability uh is is the the overarching goal um and that means eco-innovation. I actually 
don't like using using that term. I feel that innovation by uh, its essence should be ecologically friendly. There should not be innovations that are not green, so to speak, but the reality is otherwise, of course. So uh, we end up using this term. Um, and so for key enabling technologies, biotech, nanotech, Internet of Things, AI and robotics help bring about change and hopefully uh, move us uh, of course, uh, the UN Secretary Gutierrez just today talked about how uh, everything is not going so well and how we have all kinds of problems in the world. That certainly highlights the need for a, a, a renewed, redoubling, uh, renewed and redoubling F of our efforts. Uh, the UN Agenda 2030. Uh, they recognize the role of innovation, and this is the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and this is the theme of our discussion so far. Um, this includes dimensions like or, or types of innovation, like broad-based innovation, open innovation. We have been writing uh, for some time now about targeted open innovation. Uh, recognizing and highlighting the need to recognize uh, priorities and enlightened self-interest that in a way um, necessitate uh, caveats on the degree of openness, so to speak. Uh, lead user innovation, user-oriented innovation in local, targeted open innovation, this is what I just discussed, uh, targeted open innovation in a global, global local context. Um, um, and then, of course, the frameworks, the quadruple and the quintuple helix are very pertinent, in our opinion, in this, in this discussion. Um, uh, digital social innovation, innovation for the good of society and uh, using digital technologies and digitalization, again, uh, leavened, uh, uh, balanced, uh, to ensure that there is enough of a human-centric uh, perspective and, and, and emphasis. Um, and the definition of a social innovation, uh, it's about creating social capacity, uh, solving social problems, promoting collaborative teamwork, and also producing social justice. And these, of course, are all uh, important goals and pursuits. Uh, digital social innovation in particular, uh, synthesizes the innovation process, the social world, and digital ecosystems. And uh, it's about co-creating knowledge and solutions for different uh, needs. Um, and of course, using the digital uh, capabilities at a scale that was not possible to imagine earlier. Now, um, so that, that highlights under, under, under uh, scores the uh, meaning and, and definition of society 5.0 um, or super smart society where the various needs of society are finally differentiated and uh, and and you know it's ironic in a sense for those who are um, mindful of uh, uh, political uh, history, so to speak, in the evolution of movements. Um, someone many years ago uh, said uh, from everyone according to their abilities to everyone according to their needs. And of course, that led to very tragic um, implementations of ideology into a regime. I'm talking about uh, Lenin and uh, Soviet uh, empire, um, but still there is, uh, I think, some validity that cannot be uh, uh, disputed in in the fact that uh, you know having the capacity to address needs for people and being uh, available with the solutions to their needs being available when they need them, which means that in some ways there is some kind of predicting, pre pre preempting, and preventing and preempting in action. Um, and there's an element of Big Brother in this that, of course, needs to be, again, moderated. Um, that is very important. That is very significant, especially for aging societies. 
Um, so this is sort of the transition over time of the different generations of society frameworks uh, from society 1.0, the very beginning to 5.0 uh, in the present and emerging into the future. Uh, prosperous, aiming for a prosperous human centered society. Uh, society 4.0 by uh, juxtaposition and contrast is an information society uh, that realizes increasing value uh, added by connecting intangible assets as information networks. This is much more technocentric uh, view. And um, what, again, super smart society is about is building on all these things that we discussed um, some of the examples of the New Earth Initiative uh, use cases uh, or applications for policies and practices is our building blocks for this type of super smart society. Um, and in a nutshell, what this is about is the systemization of services and projects and coordination across multiple systems. Um, and so it's, it's a very, system uh, centric uh, approach a smart bridge effectively between the techno centric and human centric uh, perspectives um, and this uh, also um, allows us to uh, look at the different components uh, of both societies and economies how private sector, universities, government, and civil society uh, are interacting and interwoven. And this is exactly the implication of the helical approaches and architectures to optimize, maximize and optimize uh, the knowledge interfaces and interactions across all the different essential building blocks of societies and economies. Here you have, in fact, the um, the, the example of the different walls, uh, ministries and agencies, legal systems, technologies, human resources, uh, social acceptance, and how this approach now develops, builds bridges and, and sort of breaks through these walls. Okay. Um, so the ecosystem of innovation, um, I'll talk about if there's time, the use case along with scarce, the other use case I have is the university 5.0, sort of the, the vision of uh, um, an emerging paradigm of universities. I uh, was very much inspired by uh, Michael Crow's writings uh, about 15, 20 years ago, and since have developed about 12 years ago or 15 years ago, um, this idea of the fractal research, education, innovation ecosystem, effectively uh, a model of a university that is in essence um, a collection and a, con and a collection of nodes or a collection or a network of clusters. It's cluster being uh, transdisciplinary uh, research, education, and innovation. This is what I mean with a fractal research, education, and innovation ecosystem. There is self similar uh, uh, structures and uh, self -sim similarities embedded in the design of both a university and also all universities that make up this ecosystem of research, education, and innovation. And uh, the fractal nature is reflected in the fact that uh, there's this uh, self similar repetition of building blocks there's this this modules or nodes uh, that make up a university there's no more departments schools and so forth i can understand how that may make a traditional academic um, perhaps a normal academic rather uh, disturbed but we should really not just talk about transdisciplinarity but start enacting it uh, because among other things, all components, government, university, industry, and of course, civil society are under tremendous pressure nowadays and they need to reinvent themselves and help with all kinds of transformations, not just the, the digital one, which is the least of, of, of our um, 
challenges and opportunities and should be the list of our concerns, in fact. Uh, the other transformations are very important and education, the university is at the heart of it. In fact, I have a representation of the Quintuple Innovation Helix and the university is at the heart of it, surrounded by government, industry, civil society, and then the environment. So um, this is how that, there you go. This is how this is reflected. Um, academia, industry, government, society, environment, the universities at the core. It is really the engine uh, of new knowledge, but it's more than that. In fact, uh, about 15 years ago, I was reflecting on who we are, the academics, I mean. And I came up with this definition for better or worse, that I think has some relevance. Um, academics could be considered, perhaps should be, or strive to become uh, entrepreneurs of the mind in the business of growing people, spiritually and intellectually. So this is, I think, a very important uh, mission. And we talk about the third mission and so forth, outreach and the like. Um, we should start with ourselves and how we structure academia and this fractal research, education, and innovation ecosystem model that I have written about and it's available if people are interested um, is, I think, uh, one way to go. Uh, here's an example of how the quadruple helix uh, can be practically uh, implemented and embedded in policies and practices. And of course, one can uh, add to that the environmental issues or sustainability considerations. But we can think of, uh, you know, the four dimensions of the quadruple helix, government, university, industry, civil society on the vertical, and then technological, institutional, behavioral, and cultural uh, issues. And we provide examples uh, of what these may be. Now, think back into the New Earth Initiative and the M5 um, example I use, metrics, measurement, management, monitoring, and and how we need to reinvent all these, how we measure and so forth. Um, this is one of the cases where this comes into, um, into play in place here. Um, and then in addition, the nonlinear taxation policies, you see here many uh, cells where that can uh, be embedded and implemented. Um, and so uh, the environment, in connection, so the quintuple helix in connection with society and industry 5.0 um, is really uh, highlights the, the, the relevance and usefulness of, of these paradigms. And in fact, trying to go uh, even and beyond, uh, it sets the stage, the need for a more sustainable development and climate change challenges are reflected in the quintuple helix model that adds explicitly the fifth dimension, the environment, and sets the stage for sustainability priorities and considerations so that nature is central and equivalent to all other uh, considerations. And this is going back to the accounting and reinventing the accounting and the measurement and management and practices. Now, the European uh, Commission, the European Union has adopted the quadruple helix and the challenge and opportunity in their policies and frameworks, the challenge and opportunity is to introduce the quintuple helix explicitly and along with the industry and society 5.0, uh, make them components of, uh, again, policy making and practice shaping. And I hope the same will apply to the US and other democracies. Um, the um, these two models um, play an important role in uh, embedding societal issues and environmental considerations. So democracy in the environment being uh, species, so to speak, that they need to be safeguarded are, are, are very much uh, about, and they highlight the need for having this perspective in how we shape our policies and how design our technologies. Um, from the beginning, from the get-go, right? Uh, some more of these uh, 
you know, graphical representations uh, looking at different helices, how they're embedded in each other and how what is added in a way to provide and produce um, uh, the additional dimensions. We start with the knowledge economy with triple helix and then knowledge society and knowledge democracy in the quadruple helix and then social ecology uh, in the quintuple. Um, so uh, I have covered these uh, to some extent. Um, another, and one aspect I didn't mention is the arts, the role of the arts and I mentioned creativity, but in particular the role of the arts and artistic research um, as, as a, a driver, so to speak, of these uh, dynamics and the knowledge creation and sharing uh, top down and bottom up. Um, and, and this, this is, uh, in fact, um, we have a book series uh, called Arts Research, Innovation and Society, where we look at issues of the role of the arts on technology and society and vice versa. Um, and so um, the, uh, uh, the, the idea, and this is an important point of reference here, um, we talk about, and I, I, we list here, democracy of knowledge. Uh, one other of the book series I have with Paul Grave uh, called um, Democracy, Innovation and Entrepreneurship for Growth. So the acronym could be DIE for growth, uh, I guess, um, is about, is, is, is really interested in looking at long-term effects and trends, uh, comparing uh, more autocratic versus more democratic regimes and whether the former or the latter tend to be or prove to be uh, better innovators over the long term. And this is not again about just about technology uh, for profit maximization in the short term, uh, you know, high tech startups and so forth. That is a big part of it, but it's not everything. There is uh, a component of uh, certainly industrial policy and um, technologies that are developed in, as infrastructural uh, public interest technologies um, over the long term and how they, they, they can transform, enhance the productivity and capabilities of a society and an economy. It is an open question whether a democracy, uh, and again, the issues, the short term is with the elections versus the lack of, uh, uh, through uh, the lack of openness, transparency, and responsiveness in an autocracy. Of course, there are nuances or degrees of more democratic and or more autocratic regimes. The question there being is which one would prove to be more uh, competent as innovator, as an innovator. And there are interesting historical examples. Um, I don't have these slides here, but uh, I have in the past discussed and presented the, the, the case of China in the Middle Ages, how it was rather ahead of most of the world, certainly Europe at the time, uh, until in the 1400s, somehow it started becoming inward, insulated and, and backwards increasingly, um, and, and fell behind and became colonized and we know the story, but the point is that there was this switch at some point and it's, it's perplexing how and why it happened uh, and when, whether it might happen again, whether in a democratic or an autocratic context. Uh, <clears throat> um, this is really uh, about the uh, rise and decline of, of great uh, powers and, and so forth. There's all kinds of interesting studies on that. Um, the um, uh, model, so to speak, the different ways to look at the quadruple helix. We have different perspectives. Uh, the Fraunhofer network of uh, research and development facilities, uh, Intel. Uh, so this has been broadly adopted. I mentioned the European Commission, but companies and other organizations have been adopting and using this, the quadruple helix, innovation helix framework. 
this is a sort of a gyroscopic view of, uh, of the quintuple helix. What is of interest and relevance here is the, the how we design and how we study uh, the interfaces across the different uh, uh, threads, the five threads, so to speak, here of the quintuple innovation helix framework and how we design and then test um, uh, sort of the filters ac across the knowledge interfaces. So different views, different perspectives can be uh, useful in different ways. Uh, this one, for instance, so what overlaps we may have and what conditions and conditionalities may exist uh, for instance, we denote high, uh, smart growth being at the heart of it all, uh, where we have uh, presumably, uh, if not optimal, suboptimal design and operation of the different components of the quadruple helix, and of course, in a rather sustainable uh, manner regarding the environment. Um, this is now connecting the quintuple helix with the industry 5.0 um, using uh, multi-criteria decision analysis mcda um, to identify uh, priorities and again sub-optimize the design of uh, the structures and the interfaces again that's connected to some of the examples use or use cases i referred to earlier like um, the capacity to use technology and artificial intelligence, in particular, uh, real-time dynamic, dynamically adaptive uh, uh, solutions um, that are, again, rather proactive uh, and also predictive, pre preventive and preemptive in terms of, of managing risk and addressing issues of solving problems. So in that context, uh, along with Industry 5.0 and Society 5.0, we have Risk Management 5.0. And, and, and this is also, there's another related publication we have on that uh, recently, uh, leveraging our AI, blockchain, and internal things technologies to uh, both design smarter solutions and manage the uh, side effects of those. And that certainly would apply uh, to some extent to, uh, for instance, uh, nuclear fusion solutions, for instance, if one chose to move along these lines. A couple of thoughts here on the future now, um, whether AI uh, will truly introduce high degrees of unemployment. Just before the uh, onset of COVID, there was great concern about this. Um, Time will show exactly how things will play out. Um, uh, it seems to me that there is going to be such a qualitative transformation that the direct impact of AI, uh, uh, tra qualitative transformation in the way we live, work, and function in our societies and economies, that, that the impact of AI will not be uh, as apparent. It will not be easy to identify um, uh, substitution effects, so to speak, and, and dislocation effects. At the same time, there's already clear evidence that, again, there is a, a, an imperative for a qualitative transformation. And in connection with this, uh, the, 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 uh, the great um, uh, resignation, so to speak, uh, wave uh, right after the uh, peak of the COVID uh, pandemic may be related. Um, we have done some work on the future of labor and the future of education uh, in this regard. Uh, as part of the as a book in this, the Arts Research Innovation Society book series I mentioned. Uh, then the other uh, issue is artificial intelligence and human intelligence. Um, there is room and need for synthesis, sort of a, a bionic or what we call centaur intelligence. Uh, how that will play out, of course, uh, is not clear uh, yet. And again, this is great, in my mind, significance for public interest technologies um, that already, you know, lead users or bleeding users, perhaps, who have been embedding uh, 
technology in their bodies. They've become to some extent bionic in that sense. Um, then we have democracy, knowledge, and innovation. Um, our position and premise is that democracy and the, the, the more the, the more high the quality of a democracy is, and that relates to transparency, representation, and participation uh, factors or dimensions, uh, is an innovation enabler. Um, and therefore, by extension, autocracies tend to be in a way, suppressors of innovation, or albeit they, as we note, benefit, cross benefit from innovation and all the successes of democracy. Again, to um, quote, I think Lenin again, he said that the capitalists will sell us the rope that will hang them with. So, um, well, uh, an ironic case in point that is now playing out to the consternation of, of, of Europe and the world is that, uh, unfortunately, um, countries like Germany, uh, they chose to benefit from cheap Russian natural gas, oil, and so forth to produce their great products and services and sell them to China to help that country become uh, an emerging uh, autocratic superpower. So very Faustian uh, dilemma and choice. Now, over the medium to long term, our fundamental belief and premise is that true and transparent democracy is a sine qua non for smart, sustainable, and inclusive growth. So we said about 10 years ago, and I think it remains relevant, in fact, uh, prescient to some extent, uh, we feel, we felt then and we still believe that uh, the helices, the, the helical models, in fact, the, the unified uh, helical architecture approach and theory can better serve and architect uh, better tomorrow. All right, so uh, real quick now, two use cases. Uh, scarce in action, um, these are concepts that we developed, uh, again, about 15 years ago. A, a term we've actually trademarked um, the acronym uh pronounce scarce like the word in english uh, doesn't denote rarity uh, may denote of course something that is valuable hopefully uh we 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 uh consider those real option drivers so this is about drivers of real options uh, real versus financial options um and in other words making choices and taking calculated risks in whether and how and when to develop a certain technology or for that matter, uh, start a company or do other things that relate to uh, under conditions and under risk and with risk and uncertainty in the background, uh, make decisions. Uh, to obviously uh, maximize the value added of what you're doing. Um, in the context of competition, co-evolution, co-specialization, in other words, you don't operate in a vacuum, whether you're in an ecosystem or in a society or an economy, uh, as you operate and you take action, there is uh reaction and uh, you're always competing for scarce resources and opportunities with others uh, you may choose to collaborate or may have to collaborate with your competitors under certain conditions for the benefit of all this is in fact a very important ingredient of what we would think of or i would understand uh, public interest to be uh, and at the same time, as you do that, you change, you co-evolve and you change towards a more effective and efficient set of configurations. So you co-specialize and the cycle repeats again. So um, uh, these concepts refer to how you, how that cycle manifests and unfolds. Uh, strategic knowledge serendipity is about the unintended benefits of enabling knowledge to spill over between employees, groups, and functional domains, uh, what we call happy accidents in learning. 
and more specifically describes the capacity to identify, recognize, access, and integrate knowledge assets more effectively and efficiently to derive, develop, and capture non-appropriable, defensible, sustainable, and scalable pecuniary benefits. In, in simple English, this is about how being in a certain network or an ecosystem, you come across things you didn't expect, you were not looking for, and you know, in, in our, uh, our research with intelligent agents, modeling and so forth, we've, we've modeled uh, the uh, East Coast Boston area versus the uh, Silicon Valley area versus other areas as innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystems. And there is, uh, we'll show, we'll discuss next, there are clear uh, findings, there's clear messages there. The, the, the quality and maturity of an ecosystem defines and determines uh, whether and how it will become more successful or not and for that matter sustainable financially socially and environmentally and so that has serious implications for many parts of the world where governments throw money at problems they invest in creating poles of excellence or competitiveness and so forth and 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 they try to basically emulate recreate silicon valleys and uh, it's like gardening you can't just make a garden happen you need time patience and persistence to put together different ingredients and help it help nurture it uh, help nurture its growth then the arbitrage uh, effect is about the ability to distribute and use specific knowledge for applications other than the intended intended topic areas or lateral use uh, applications um, create, identify, reallocate, and recombine knowledge assets to derive, develop, and capture non-appropriable, defensible, sustainable, and scalable pecuniary benefits. So now, if you have the happy accidents again, thanks to the, the 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 quality, scale, and scope of your networking, and who is in your network, you may have the ability to to truly make a killing, basically. Um, have this arbitrage capability vis-a-vis -vis your other competitors of yours that may be outside the particular network. Um, so uh, operationalizing this whole approach can greatly benefit from crowdsourcing, crowdfunding, and crowdstorming modalities, because it's about these, 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 these are tools, social media modalities in a way for uh, supporting the gardening, uh, as I called it, effect. Uh, um, patient innovation gardeners. I, um, I it reminds me of some time ago when there was this crisis in Europe again, and uh, people were talking about the countries in trouble, uh, Portugal, Ireland, Greece, and Spain. They called them the pigs. And I said, well, we may also want to think about patient Innovation Gardeners, another acronym, uh, another way to, to have an acronym, the word PIGS, uh, to be a more constructive way to figure out a way out of the problem. Um, so smart cities uh, is a case in point of how a particular ecosystem of innovation entrepreneurship can be embedded uh, geographically, uh, but also socially and um, architecturally um, and and where you can have uh, high density effects uh, of population <clears throat> but also other assets we talk about the different knowledge assets <clears throat> and this can have higher order effects that are very substantial okay <clears throat> so it's important to have in this sense in our design thinking Agile design thinking approach, um, triple pot, top line, uh, meaning eth effective, efficient, and ethical, as well as triple bottom line, environmental, financial, and social sustainable considerations and, and how we define our metrics. <clears throat> now, here uh, is an example of an ecosystem. <clears throat> And the, the small circles, uh, this shows um, uh, <clears throat> macro, meso, and micro level um, snapshot, so to speak, of, of, of an ecosystem, meaning at the national level, sectoral, and <clears throat> local levels. And the 
the building blocks. This is sort of a fractal. Uh, it's meant to be a fractal uh, uh, design. Um, the building blocks, uh, the small the small circles are the building blocks. Effectively, people, culture, and technology bundles, which could be companies or research centers and so forth, as I discussed earlier. And in this sense, one could envision uh, universities in the in the manner that I described as fractal research, education, and innovation ecosystem uh, configurations, <clears throat> but also other components of uh, government, public sector, or private sector um, uh, threads or dimensions of the society and the economy. So the, again, the bundles that I mentioned, people, culture, and technology, these are, are, are the ingredients of of, of the building blocks of this um, uh, fractal approach uh, and uh, business model and, and the way they coexist, co-opete, co-evolve and co-specialize, uh, both concerning its individual bundle and how they interact with each other. Uh, is guided by certain principles uh, aiming towards more effective and efficient uh, design solutions. Here we therefore talk about business model innovation <clears throat> that aims to be uh, robust, remunerative, and resilient. This is the R3. Uh, so uh, there is again related literature and research on that. Um, and this is a view, a perspective on how uh, knowledge, you know, the, the basic inputs to economic activity, uh, knowledge, technology, entrepreneurship, land, labor, and capital are combined. Uh, they're sort of uh, um, synthesized through effects of competition, coevolution, co specialization to produce results like firms that grow, are more profitable, and so forth. And, and this is a sort of a um, an, an outside the box view of how um, well you have an input output uh, perspective on an ecosystem and the more mature it is obviously the more effective and efficient um, it becomes now um, there is also a, a sort of a, an outreach uh, in the sense of diplomacy kind of perspective uh, that would be very useful in our context. Uh, so we have science and cultural, but also innovation diplomacy. This could be uh, connecting countries as well as uh, different networks and groups uh, within across countries. Um, all of them serving uh, the mission priority of smart, sustainable, and inclusive growth. And, and then. Um, Another example of a use case, how this could be useful is an area where we've been looking into how to best uh, support, integrate uh, displaced people. And these, we have been looking at this uh, regarding, of course, and concerning a major challenge uh, for many uh, countries in Europe, but also you have a border uh, we have a border to the south of the U.S., and you have a border in Arizona where uh, human misery visits daily and nightly. And, uh, you know, what we're discussing here could be put to good use in that sense uh, to, to figure out ways to better uh, integrate people and, uh, of course, thinking of displaced people in a broader sense. So I talk about those social, economic, and political refugees that may be not just coming from outside a country, but may well be uh, indigenous in a way. So we need to address both of these. I don't have time to discuss that in more detail. This is a use case and something we've been working on. Uh, another uh, case is with, uh, of course, the core of, information technology and AI applications. Um, in fact, there's a handbook uh, on, on cyber uh, defense development and democracy we have. Um, and we have forthcoming actually um, two handbooks on AI, innovation, entrepreneurship, and 
another one on cyber defense development, democracy, and diplomacy, so cyber D4. Um, but this looks at whether and how, in fact, cyber security, as we call it, in some ways I can talk about, I've written and presented about cyber insecurity, um, <clears throat> can actually best serve, again, the public interest technology uh, perspective can best serve uh, cyber defense, cyber development, and cyber democracy priorities. Um, and this is sort of a, a mental map, if you wish, uh, looking at different uh, dynamic, the, the, looking at the dynamics of different components uh, where big data analytics can help uh, provide and support entrepreneurial uh, performance, produce and, and, and support sustainable entrepreneurship, but also uh, achieve robust competitiveness using uh, analysis, learning competences, and uh, real-time data information and knowledge analysis, and then learning competences. Um, we talked about uh, earlier the smart cities. Uh, this is, again, another mental map of the uh, uh, how the different components in the design of a smart city, um, looking at the different issues that one needs to take into account. Um, and then um, going back to my smart development book in 2005, uh, there are effectively three dimensions or three perspectives one needs to take into account. Uh, economic, organizational, and technological, looking at your options and the challenges and opportunities that you have for uh, leapfrogging uh, development, uh, looking at both at all uh, high, medium, and low tech issues, uh, and then for profit, not for profit, and public private international uh, configurations in developed, emerging, and developing economies. Um, I'll go quickly over this. Uh, these are slides about the mode three knowledge production systems. And you see at the heart of it is the higher education system. Um, and we talk about the concept of the academic firm in our writings, effectively uh, entrepreneurial uh, startups that help connect, interface the university with the world, the market and society. Um, and, and of course, that is a sort of a complement of the entrepreneur, what we call the entrepreneurial university, where uh, that we see here, where, of course, uh, we need to re remember that entrepreneurial doesn't mean, uh, in a narrow sense, profit maximizing. It means benefit maximizing for stakeholders, not profit profit maximizing for stock owners. Okay, so. Um, this is, uh, again, the different components in the smart cities context where the quadruple helix could enable uh, the design and development of a, of a smart city, university sector, industry, government, and civil society sector. Um, in fact, we have done uh, sort of a thought experiments, if you wish, or, or, or uh, pilot studies bringing stakeholders from all four areas uh, in given cities and trying to model what a smart city future might be for that particular city uh, in different parts in, in Europe uh, with interesting results. I mean, people got to talk with each other and that brought an interesting dynamic and insights by uh, just taking that initiative. And then we had follow-ups that were very interesting. Um, so um, there's actually a methodology uh, for uh, developing solutions, starting with co-creation workshops, uh, funding and pooling resources, qualitative research experiments, pilots, quantitative research, and then commercialization and scaling of these solutions. This is what I talked about, the pilots, smart city, envisioning, futures envisioning uh, exercise. Um, this is the graphic from our research on the uh, innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystems and how the mature ones, in fact, uh, were sources of value creation. The, if, if you are immature, however, you end up uh, 
destroying value. And so it's like throwing money down a sinkhole and entrepreneurs intuitively know that and they avoid such cases. But once you get to maturity, sufficient critical mass of maturity, then that things change dramatically, exponentially, as you say. Um, just some, uh, this is part of our nitty gritty design uh, approach with the intelligent agents and the design of the ecosystem uh, and sort of uh, dynamic uh, uh, modeling of, of this uh, this approach, this process. Um, and the, the, again, that has been uh, published in an IEEE uh, paper. Um, so we have knowledge acquisition formality, knowledge serendipity, knowledge arbitrage and network typology. Uh, these are the four mechanisms of knowledge appropriation. What I said already, in some regard, I've already covered this part, but this is, this is about the university's 5.0 vision uh, about reinventing themselves and a balanced techno and human centric. And so um, let me silently give me a moment to just silently go through these slides uh, that I think relate and should inform our thinking and action. Uh, this is about Martin Luther King's uh, Have a Dream speech, and this is uh, JFK's We Choose to Go to the Moon. Um, uh, and then this is a poem, this is in German, this is a poem from the 30s about uh, how uh, the thoughts are free, basically implying that, you know, autocracy and tyranny cannot stop you from having free thoughts. Again, from a technological point of view, we're at a point where this actually is changing. Technology may actually uh, soon be able to read our thoughts, and this could be of concern. And I'm closing with this about Plato, about philosophers needing to be kings, otherwise we're in trouble. Uh, or rather, kings being needing to be philosophers otherwise. So interesting uh, issue concerning actually the, 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 the passing of the queen in, in Britain and all the uh, festivities that followed. Thank you all for your time. Um, I hope there was some value added in all this. And uh, again, I appreciate your opportunity, the opportunity to connect and happy to come back if you want me. We would love you to come back. Uh, there are lots of cheers and thanks uh, coming through in the chat. I hope you get a chance to read them before we imminently uh, end the call. But I just wanted to say what an incredible preparation that was for us at the Pit Colloquium, uh, Elias. We're so honored. You know, uh, it's not just, uh, Pitt doesn't draw just academics, but academics with feeling, uh, academics with wisdom, and your life's work uh, has been traveling down this path for a lot, long time. Uh, there's not a class that goes by at ASU, I don't think a, a single one of your papers is not mentioned, um, but the what, the how, and the why uh, is what you showed us, these big picture frameworks, these big picture trends, the ability to potentially mobilize resources, at that international level, but with a global and local emphasis where change is ever present in uh, proximity, we can see it happening bef before us. Um, it's a, 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 a thanks to the appreciative theories, but also understanding how we can go from these principles right through to design and then action um, towards formal methods. You have formalized some of these things and we have seen them in your cases. It's not just concepts that you're teaching uh, and putting forward. So how to make this change uh, with initiatives like the New Earth Initiative. You talked about strategies, policies, practices, politics. You talked about things that we can't predict and what we do about them. Uh, you talked about the importance of democracy, peace and the environment, balancing the upwards motions with the downwards, the top down with the bottom up, learning how to learn, you said, and understanding what that means in the quadruple and quintuple and beyond helices, you introduced to us Utoha and SCARS, or scarce, I should pronounce it. You talked about the importance of digitalization and the impact and disruption that's had going from the socio-technical, socio-economic, socio-political, and uh, warning us, right, about the discourse uh, that it seems to have been dissolved by these uh, pressures by new technologies, the movement and trends from te technocentrism to human centricism from the uh, 4.0 to 5.0, uh, 
you talked to us also about risk 5.0 about the new technologies you also talked about the uh not the triple bottom line but the quadruple bottom line uh and you insisted on public private people and planet coming into the equation and the fifth dimension the environment that we can't uh, forget because without the environment there is no human species there are no species full stop so i want to say a big thank you on behalf of the class um i think there is a window of opportunity that we can invite you back in late october to go through a series of questions we even had questions from the audience but i do want us to talk about systemization of services and projects and i want to talk about smart cities more and this notion of the new ecosystem of innovation you are truly a transdisciplinary scholar you've really stretched us today but pro provided it with us these models and these frameworks that we should all be familiar with when we're talking about enacting long-term change not this knee-jerk reaction towards profit maximization so with that i want to say thank you to the audience of who's been able to remain behind we have uh, almost 30 people here and professor thank you for your time and your energy over the decades of your research there's so much more to unpack in the coming colloquium with you. I, I thank you so much for this. I'm really moved by your comments and the opportunity and recognition. I uh, I definitely want to uh, schedule more interactions. Perhaps people can uh, uh, review some of the materials and the, the, the discussion and the recording and then uh, develop further uh, streams of thought and come back to address the questions you already uh, outline for me uh, as I requested and thank you for doing that uh, I promise to actually look at those and send you some comments that you can share with everybody and I'm happy to schedule another chat and we are at a juncture if I if, in closing if I may um yes, you know please. I'm I'm I, you know I was born in Greece I uh, my grandfather was in the U.S. and I'm uh became American a uh, naturalized American 25 plus years ago I so I'm, I'm European by birth and American by choice. I feel that our democracies are very critical juncture points along with the climate. And to me, therefore, this is not just an interesting kind of research to keep busy. This, this is about uh, truly uh, our future. And I really hope uh, we can come up with some uh, useful enough insights to influence and impact uh, policymakers, those kings that need to become more philosophical, whether elected or not. We have to do all we can to inject philosophy into them. That's mm -hmm. my parting shot, so to speak, and, and, and thank you. Thank you, and uh, we totally agree with you, and that's why we'll have you back and really get into those uh, questions and have people participate you know we've got people on the chat who said they woke up at 4 a.m every moment of this presentation was worth it what an education you've provided for us thank you so much to everyone who's come and given their thanks the youtube for this video will be available within the next two weeks and so look out for it on the sfis playlist for public interest technology and we will definitely have professor elias karyanis back for a part two in the not too distant future Thank you, everyone, and have a lovely day. Great. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Bye now, everyone.